I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the award-winning PRS Journal Club podcast with your hosts, Drs. Francesco Agro, Nikki Phillips, and Ira Savetsky. Enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the February 2018 edition of the PRS Journal Club podcast. My name is Francesco Agro, PRS Resident Ambassador from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And as always, I'm joined by my co-residents ambassadors, Ira Savetsky from NYU and Nikki Phillips from the Harvard Plastic Surgery Program. Today we have the great honor of being joined by Dr. Alexis Hazen as our guest moderator. Dr. Hazen is an associate professor of plastic surgery from NYU and director of their Aesthetic Surgery Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazen, for joining us for this PRS Journal Club podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm happy to be here. The article we'll be discussing is the lateral thigh perforator flap for autologous breast reconstruction, a prospective analysis of 138 flaps by Dr. Swinder, Bagels, Latester, Dehan, Piatkowski, Sancier, Van der Holst, and Dr. Allen. A quick reminder that this article, along all of the articles that are discussed in this podcast, can be read for free on prsjournal.com, including an archive of all past Journal Club articles. Over the last three decades, major advances have been made in the field of autologous breast reconstruction. While abdominal base free flaps are most commonly the first choice, Often they are not used because of patient preference or because the abdomen may not be suitable as a donor site due to insufficient subcutaneous abdominal tissue, abdominal scarring, or insufficient abdominal perforators. The septocutaneous tensor fascia lata flap, or TFL, was introduced as an alternative flap for autologous breast reconstruction. And this represents an evolution of the myocutaneous TFL flap, first described by Hale and Nahai and colleagues in 78, which was then adopted for breast reconstruction by Elliott and colleagues in 1990 and was later refined to a perforator flap by Kind and colleagues and into a septocutaneous flap by the authors of this paper in 2012. The flap was later renamed the lateral thigh perforator flap or LTP flap if it is based on the septocutaneous perforators in the posterior septum. And the aim of this paper was to analyze the author's experience with the lateral thigh perforator flap and present the surgical refinements that were introduced over the past four years. The authors described in detail their approach, which starts by taking preoperative MRA to identify the number and course of the septocutaneous branches of the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex artery and identify maximum pedicle length. And then they describe the preoperative markings to provide an estimate of perforator location, which can be confirmed with a Doppler, and marking of the flap itself, which ranges between 6 and 9 centimeters in width and 18 and 22 centimeters in length. The authors then described in detail their surgical technique, starting with the patient in a supine position. The dissection of the flap starts immediately and continues laterally along the markings and care is taken not to damage the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. The dissection then proceeds above the fascia of the TFL and the fascia covering the posterior septum is then open longitudinally for the total width of the flap and the septocutaneous perforators are identified. Then blunt dissection of the perforators continue to its origin from the ascending branch of the lateral circumflex femoral artery. Then the perforator is clipped and dissected, leaving a pedicle length usually between 6 and 8 centimeters. And the authors recommend to use the left donor side to reconstruct the left breast and the right donor side for the right breast. And then to facilitate donor side closure, the authors recommend undermining caudally and placing several quilting sutures to approximate the subcutaneous tissue to the fascia. Also, they perform liposuction of the thighs region to minimize contour defects and the harvested fat is used for fat grafting in the pectoralis major muscle to prevent volume deficit of the upper pole. The authors then discuss the lessons learned over the years and surgical refinement techniques to minimize complications, which include a flap width of maximum 6 centimeters, the use of three rows of quilting sutures at the donor site, liposuction distally of the donor side to reduce contour defects, subsequent fat grafting in the pectoralis major muscle to augment the upper pole, and lastly, the donor side was no longer beveled. Looking at the results, the authors conducted a prospective study of all lateral thigh perforator flaps breast reconstructions performed since September 2012, and these were conducted in three centers in Maastricht, the Netherlands, and in New York and New Orleans in the United States, looking at operative details, complications, and flap re-exploration. 
A total of 138 LTP flaps were either unilateral, bilateral, or stacked were performed in 86 consecutive patients, with approximately two-thirds of patients operated in the Netherlands. The mean age was 47 years and median BMI was 24. Preoperative imaging with MRI was performed in all patients. And the most common indications for choosing an LTP flap over a deep flap were patients having insufficient subcutaneous abdominal tissue in 59% of patients or having abdominal scarring in 27% of patients followed by patient preference in 10%. Of note, not only one patient had better septicogenous perforators than abdominal perforators as assessed by MRA. Then 37% of reconstruction were tertiary, mostly because of complaints associated with tissue expanders or prosthesis. And the median operation time was 277 minutes for unilateral and 451 minutes for bilateral procedures. The median ischemia time was 45 minutes and the median flap weight was 348 grams. The authors report a total of two flap losses, one partial flap loss, five venous congestive flaps, and re-exploration in 11 flaps, which resulted in uh, viable flaps. Whereas the incidence of donor site complication decreased significantly after the surgical refinements were introduced. Wound problems decreased from 40% to 6%, whereas the seroma rates from 25% to 9.5%, and infection rates from 27.5% to 9.5 percent so very significant decrease i thought this was a great paper which provides great evidence that uh, lateral thigh perforator flaps are a good alternative to abdominal based breast reconstruction flaps the authors did a phenomenal job to provide a clear overview of this flap guiding us through the whole process they provide useful information on the indications preoperative planning and operative technique which combined with the excellent figures in the paper and the surgical refinement pearls, I feel this article provides an invaluable resource for the plastic surgeon wanting to include LTP flaps in the reconstructive armamentarium. In my opinion, the key take-home message is that LTP flap is an appropriate alternative to abdominal base flaps, but patient selection is uh, certainly key and one needs to be familiar with the indications for this procedure. One of the challenges in implementing LTP flaps as an alternative, I think, is the patient population that a surgeon works with. For instance, here in Pittsburgh, we rarely find good candidates for LTP because of their body habitus. Dr. Heisen, what are your indications to the use of LTP flaps, and how frequently are your patients potential candidates for these flaps? I think your point about the BMI, you know, the average BMI on the patients in this study was 24. And I wonder whether that's a reflection of European standards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, that is probably the most important factor in this paper in terms of patient selection. And so you mentioned that Pittsburgh, you rarely find great candidates. So, you know, that is true in most places in this country. So, you know, having a low BMI, having previous abdominal surgery, abdominal scarring, or just not having enough abdominal fat to make it worthwhile to do the flap, I think that's the, the best indication. And I think that having seen their refinements in the post or the scarring and figuring out how to close the donor site in such a way that you're not left with a contour deformity, that I think has made this a really successful option. Most patients, if you really talk to them about what bothers them in terms of post-surgical scarring, it's rarely the scar. It's usually the contour deformity. People can deal with scars and there are so much that a patient can do in terms of scar management, you know, from steroid pads to laser, but a contour deformity, a patient can't solve for themselves. So I think with their evolution in terms of their donor site closure and managing that, really the defect of the donor site, I think that's made this a really successful option. Absolutely, and uh, it's great that they implement already liposuction uh, within the procedure instead of performing as a secondary revision. The other aspect of the donor site closure is, you know, if you looked at the seroma rates and infection rates, how over time they also were reduced dramatically. Infection rates, I'm not sure why that went down so dramatically, but obviously the use of the quilting sutures made a big difference in seroma rates. 
and it's such a simple method yeah and also uh, the the wound complications went down from 40 to 6 percent i mean that's an exponential decrease absolutely thank you so much dr hazen what about you nikki what were your thoughts I agree. I think this is a great contribution to students of microsurgery and people who are, are learning about new techniques. I think that was actually one of the general points that I took away from this paper that I really liked was I liked that the author shared with us their learning process and sort of their evolution over time and how they improved their own techniques and the fact that they were pushing boundaries in the first place by designing new flaps that they could use. And so one of the thoughts I had after reading this paper, and, and I'd be curious to hear, Dr. Hazen, what your thoughts are on this, are about the learning habits that we develop as surgeons. And what are the best way that we can approach as residents or junior attendings, we can approach problems and create habits that set us on the path towards becoming the kind of surgeon who will push boundaries and innovate and critically examine our own results. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. It's such a good question. And one of the things I was thinking about this paper is when I was in training, we didn't have perforator flaps. They weren't done. You know, we had <laughs> a couple of free flap options, but perforator flaps were just beginning to evolve. So I think, you know, the thing about being a surgeon, it really is a process of lifelong learning. And there are so many techniques that just didn't even exist. And the idea of doing a free flap with just loops, you know, that was unheard of in my day in training. I think participating in things like Journal Club, I think you don't have to be in an academic medical center to stay on top of the literature and what's being propelled forward. And I think you don't want to be the first one to jump on the bandwagon because, for example, we were talking about another paper looking at PRP. You don't want to start doing something before you know that it's effective or before you know what the downside is. But I think always staying involved with the literature and what's on the forefront. And then you can always go to courses to learn things that, you know, you maybe didn't learn in your training. And I think, you know, the, one of the great things about our profession is that we have to keep learning. We have CME requirements that require us to participate in conferences and learning opportunities. And so I think that's really the way, but approach it with enthusiasm, curiosity, and then not hesitancy, but I think sort of a little bit of skepticism so that you understand all the potential complications of a new technique. That's great. Thank you so much for that. Ira, what did you think about this paper? I agree with everything that was stated, and I really enjoyed this discussion. This was an excellent study, and, and being a resident at NYU, I've had the privilege to work with Dr. Allen. and. He is truly a master microsurgeon and a true expert when it comes to autologous breast reconstruction. As we had already discussed, in general, abdominal-based free flaps are the go-to for autologous breast reconstruction, and we really become so good and efficient at it. The authors advocate the lateral thigh flap to be the next best option. And they cite that it's a relatively easy septocutaneous perforated dissection, short operative time, and favor tissue pliability and projection. But again, I think it's important to take into consideration that Dr. Allen is such a master, as is his colleagues, that what's easy for them may not be so easy for us. So I think it's important to just keep that in mind. The authors also advocate preoperative imaging, and this tends to be an area of great debate. Here at NYU, we tend to get imaging for most of our free flops. I know that Dr. Sorletti is a big proponent of not necessarily getting preoperative imaging and more selective I'm curious, Francisco, what's happening at Pittsburgh? And Nikki, what's happening at the Harvard program? And then Dr. Hazen, what are your thoughts about it? I'll start by saying that here at Pittsburgh, routinely we do CT angiograms and so uh, for pre-op planning. And we always uh, kind of take them and think about SIAs and uh, DIPs first. And then if, if that's not an option, you know, it also depends on patient preference. So if, if we have one of the surgeons who's uh, Dr. Gambo, he does a bunch of these LTP flaps. But as I mentioned earlier, it really depends. Patients that are good candidates for LTP flaps, they're hard to come by. But regardless, they all uh, preoperative, they all uh, have imaging done. Yeah, and I'd say we're trending in that direction here at Harvard as well. It is certainly different between institutions. And so at the Brigham, for instance, almost every deep flap has CTEA uh, imaging performed beforehand. It has not always been that way at Beth Israel, but we are sort of moving towards getting more imaging. And so I'd say on the whole, we're as a program moving more towards imaging, but it is certainly 
case by case dependent and, and institution dependent as well. Dr. Hazen, what are your thoughts about weighing the cost of getting an expensive test versus heading into an operation with a definitive game plan? Do you think it's necessary? I think one of the problems is the learning curve for the people performing the CT angio. So if you have a team that routinely performs CT angio and really understands what you're looking for and does a quote unquote really good job, it's invaluable. But if you have people who don't routinely do it, doing it, then if they capture the dye at just the wrong time with the images, then it can give you not only unhelpful misinformation, but misleading information. So I think, you know, some of it depends on the institution and whether you have a dedicated person or persons who will do this. And I think if you do, it's incredibly useful because then you're going in with a roadmap and you can target the vessels just based on the imaging and you don't have to mess around with sort of trying to figure out which is the best perforator because you're going to see it. So I think it shaves off time. But, you know, I have been at an institution where they did not have the expertise, you know, because somebody had left and so there was this learning curve. And during that time period, the images were really, really unhelpful. I agree with you, Dr. Hazen. I'm still learning, obviously, I'm I'm, uh, just a resident, but I feel that when we go through scans, it just helps so much to visualize where the perforators are. Not only, you know, the size of the perforators, the location, but also their path. So that means that you can really plan ahead in terms of maybe taking one lateral row versus medial row or so on. And so making your life much easier and intraoperatively. And, you know, now I feel there is uh, such an array of options for uh, breast reconstruction, let aside implant-based reconstruction, but in terms of free flaps, you know, so there's lots of options for non-abdominal-based flaps, pap flaps, uh, gluteal flaps, and so on. What would be your go-to flaps if in candidates who are not candidates for abdominal-based flaps? After reading this paper, I think it's an awesome flap, but in most patients who we come across, we're not going to have that option. I know it's sort of unpopular, but I actually really like a lat flap with an implant. It looks absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, you could think of it as the worst of all worlds because you're having a flap, you're taking muscle, and you're using an implant. But, you know, a lot of times our flaps don't have enough projection superiorly, and we end up fat grafting them. And I think it's a very simple flap to raise, and people don't mind the donor site because they don't see it. and it usually doesn't result in a contour deformity. So I actually really like that flap. The S gap is, everybody has that donor site, regardless of your your size or shape. It's really not a pliable flap. So unless you're doing bilateral or the person has very, it almost looks like an implant. So it's always available. It's a pretty difficult dissection. And it's great if you are trying to match an implant or somebody with very non-product breasts. Those are great points. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazen. And thank you, everyone, for another phenomenal podcast. I think with that, we'll end our discussion of this article. Remember to tune in to the other two articles we'll be discussing on this month's podcast, as well as the PRS Journal Club podcast that will be broadcast every month. Also, don't forget to participate in our monthly PRS Journal Club on Facebook, where we will be able to interact directly with this month's selected articles authors. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Hazen, for joining us on our February podcast. Absolutely. Happy to be here. (laughs) 